So if I'd like to introduce Dr. Helen Watts. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I just want to clarify, I haven't worked for Greenpeace since uh, 2001, but I did uh, do the report rock solid as a consultancy report, so it was funded by Greenpeace International. But I'm here speaking in a personal capacity, and I'm really here because I was in Cumbria as an expert witness way back at the Naritz inquiry back in 1997. And uh, we knew then, or we knew within a couple of years of that inquiry, that they would try to come back to West Cumbria and to try and bury nuclear waste here again. And I promised myself uh, when I left Greenpeace in 2001 that if that ever happened, I would come back here and I would explain to people why Naritz uh, lost that inquiry and why there are serious safety issues about very nuclear waste here. So this is an overview of what I'm going to talk about. There's quite a lot of information, uh, but I'm going to try and make it relevant to the decisions and processes that are happening here now. So I'm going to start with some of the information in the report Rock Solid, which is about the safety issues associated with deep nuclear waste disposal. I'm going to focus that particularly on high-level nuclear waste and spent nuclear fuel, heat <coughs> generating waste. I'm then going to say something about the findings of the NARIPS inquiry back in uh, 1997, which was a proposal to build the first phase of a repository uh, close to Southfield, but for intermediate level waste, so uh, a less dangerous category of waste. I'm going to talk about the relevance of those findings to today's proposal here and something about the political process down in London, down in Westminster. So I'm not an expert of what's happening here in terms of all the details of the debate, but I do spend a lot of time down at Westminster, so I know quite a lot about uh, what happens in terms of decisions down there. And I'm going to give you my view on the next phase, the decision to participate, that might uh, be made here. Can I just ask you to raise the mic just sure. a little bit? Is that better? Yeah, because you were losing odd words. Okay. So in terms of, uh, the first question is what is the problem? Well, we have high level waste and spent nuclear fuel from nuclear reactors. They are heat generating waste. So the spent nuclear fuel is what comes out of the core of the reactor and uh, it's very highly radioactive because of the nuclear chain reaction that's generating heat there. Uh, about 10,000 tonnes of spent nuclear fuel are generated annually around the world, uh, and high-level waste uh, results from reprocessing of that spent nuclear fuel. So many countries don't reprocess, but countries like the UK where there is reprocessing, as you know, uh, you will get a smaller volume of heat generating high level waste, but you will also get a big volume of other wastes, including so called intermediate level waste, which contain some uh, long lived radioactive elements uh, which uh, also survive a long time in the environment. So, deep geological disposal has been researched since the 1970s, but it's not yet implemented anywhere in the world. Uh, for high-level waste. So uh, you're talking about a concept which involves excavation deep underground, about 500 metres or more, uh, the, the deposition of the waste in shafts inside tunnels, so very large-scale excavation, uh, several different concepts, which I'll say a bit more about, but uh, mainly for spent nuclear fuel, you're talking about having copper canisters around the fuel, but for high-level waste, you're talking about steel overpacks around that uh, vitrified waste, so those glass blocks. And then you're going to backfill around those wastes uh, with either with clay, bentonite clay, which is intended to hold swell and hold packages in place and also slow the release of radio, uh, radionuclides, or with cement. And so there's a whole series of phases if you want to build a repository, including siting, construction, encapsulation of those wastes in the packaging, emplacement, and then finally the sealing and the closure. And I'm going to talk mainly about the post-closure risk assessment. So that's the kind of safety implications for future generations rather than the immediate impacts here and now. Uh, so this is a picture from uh, the Finnish 
uh, model. So Finland and Sweden are looking at very similar approaches to disposing of spent nuclear fuel. So it just gives you an idea of the scale, uh, the fact you've got to have a very long tunnel down to depth, and you've got to have uh, places where you put the canisters containing the spent nuclear fuel. And they have to be spaced sufficiently far apart to try and keep the temperature low enough uh, to limit the effects of heat on the backfill. So the spacing is designed to try and keep that temperature down to about 100 degrees centigrade. Now that's still obviously the boiling port point of water, so you're talking about a very hot, steamy environment deep underground. Uh, this is just the periodic table. You don't need to be a scientist and to understand all the detail, but it's just to highlight that you've got very many different chemicals in spent nuclear fuel. Uh, so all the different radionuclides, the radioactive elements, have different properties, and there's a very large number, dozens of different ones, contained uh, within a single fuel rod. And that includes several different types of uh, radioactive elements which have different properties. So uh, the so-called actinides, the heavier ones, are some of the most radiotoxic, some of the most potentially damaging to health, um, including uranium and plutonium and different isotopes of those. Uh, there are also some that are particularly soluble in water and most likely to escape quickly from a repository. Iodine-129, which has a half-life, the time it takes to decay, of about 15 million years. Chlorine-36, selenium-79 are examples. And you will also have radioactive gases if there's a sufficient uh, quantity of carbon-14 in the inventory of waste, because that can escape in carbon dioxide or in methane. So it's important to understand it's a very complex problem in which these different radionuclides also occur in different chemical forms which might vary in how easily they dissolve, how easily they move around. Mm. And why are we concerned? Well, we're concerned because radiation, of course, has impacts on health. There are three main types of radiation, as you probably all know, alpha, beta and gamma, which have different energies. Uh, so alpha is the most dangerous if you actually end up breathing it in or uh, digesting it, eating it, but it also is stopped by a piece of paper. So it's, it's heavier, but it has different properties. But all these kinds of radiation can damage cells and that can potentially cause cancer or damage eggs or sperm. And the, what we're concerned about, of course, is exposures by the air, by water, by food, and also the fact that different radionuclides can build up in the food chain, in plants, in fish, in uh, food that you might eat. So that's just a schematic picture of the kind of health issues that arise when you do a risk assessment. You have to look at whether contaminated water is going to be drunk by people, whether crops or fish and so on, or uh, radionuclides in the atmosphere are going to be inhaled. So when we're talking about an underground repository, the purpose of that, of course, is to limit the risks to future generations by putting that waste deep underground. Uh, and I'm going to focus mainly on the ideas that are being discussed in Finland and Sweden, which are using crystalline rocks, hard rocks, because other countries are investigating different kinds of rock types. Germany's looking at salt, uh, Belgium and France are main, and Switzerland are mainly looking at clay. Uh, and when you consider the safety case, you need to think about two different aspects. Firstly, the near field, what happens close to the waste itself. And the key issue here is the heat that's going to be generated from the wastes. Um, and that heat is expected to persist for around 10,000 years, creating very high temperatures. And the temperature will depend on how long the waste has been cooled initially, but, as I said earlier, the Swedish and the Finnish uh, models uh, try to limit the temperature to about 1,000 degrees. 